Toward noon the next day, we arrived at a small village about 15 miles northeast of Kharkov, with a name like Aucheni. I can no longer remember precisely. The place was filled with smoke, and to judge by the noise fighting was still going on quite nearby. The Steiner of the officer who bad picked us up at the Kolkaz drew ahead while the rest of us jumped down from our machines. Flickering light a mile or so to the south marked the line of fire. The soldiers who had come with me peed into a hedge or chewed some food with blank faces. I myself have never been able to achieve a resigned, indifferent attitude in the face of pressing danger. Nevertheless, I tried to hide my desperate anxiety. Perhaps the others were doing the same thing. The Steiner came back, and two non-coms wrote down our names. Then we were organized into groups of fifteen, led either by a sergeant or an Obergefreiter, senior lance corporal or acting corporal. The officer climbed onto the seat of the Steiner and spoke to us briefly, mincing no words. The enemy has cut us off from our line of retreat. To get around them, we would have to turn north, onto the plain, where there are no roads. This could be fatal. Therefore, we will have to break through their barrage to reach our new positions, which are quite close. As further elements of the Don Army arrive, they will be used to maintain the passage already opened, which will allow all our soldiers to escape the Bolshevik noose. Thereafter, you will proceed to positions which will be announced, and which you will maintain until further orders. Good luck. Heil Hitler. I was about to say that I belonged to the transport service when I suddenly felt ashamed. Munitions boxes were opened and their contents distributed. My pockets and cartridge pouches were full and I was given two defensive grenades, which I didn't know how to operate. We moved single file to the edge of the village past houses burning from enemy incendiaries. Groups of men were walking about in the debris. Others were tending to the wounded. Some bumped out German vehicles were still smoking. We were taken over by a lieutenant who asked five or six of us to follow him down a long street, which was still more or less intact. A salvo whistled past us and we threw ourselves to the ground. It fell somewhere in the center of the village, about seven or eight hundred yards behind us. Enemy shells had dug several holes in the packed earth, which lay between two rows of buildings and occasional mutilated bodies lay sprawled on the street. We walked for about fifteen minutes, sticking close to the buildings until we heard the sound of automatic weapons. About a hundred yards ahead of us, the street was swept by mortar fire. We hesitated for a moment. Then we saw some running figures emerging from the wall of dust stirred up by the enemy salvo. Achtung! shouted the lieutenant. Instantly, we dropped to our knees or even onto our stomachs, ready to open fire, but stood up again when we saw German uniforms. The other soldiers ran over to us and threw themselves down by our sides. We could see that still more were coming through the flying dust. Several of them were howling at the tops of their lungs, a sound which combined fear, anger, and pain. I watched a soldier without a gun who was trying to run holding his right thigh with both hands. He fell, stood up, and fell again. Two others were staggering slowly after him. I heard someone shout, A moi! and was trying to see which of them had used my language when a fresh salvo struck the group, scattering about ten of them in search of shelter. Two of the men continued toward us despite the danger. They ran to a door, which they were able to kick in without much trouble, and stood in its opening, shouting curses in French. Amazed and without a thought of danger, I ran across the street, bursting in on them like a whirlwind. They paid no attention to me. Hey, I said, shaking one of them by his straps. Are you French? They turned toward me and looked at me for a fraction of a second. Then their eyes returned to a cloud of dust and smoke pouring from a house which had just burst into flames. No, the Walloon division, one of them said without looking back a second time. A series of explosions made us blink and hunch our shoulders. Those shits shoot us just like rabbits. They never take prisoners, the bastards. I'm French, I said with an uncertain smile. Well then, look out. Volunteers are never prisoners. But I'm not a volunteer. The street was raked by a new salvo of mortar fire somewhat closer than before. Twenty yards away a roof disintegrated and the retreat whistle broke off our conversation. We ran as hard as we could back the way we had just come, followed by a burst of machine gun fire. <laughs>
two or three men spun round and doubled up, screaming with pain. We almost ran over two men with a heavy machine gun, which they hadn't been able to fire, because we'd been in the way. Several groups of men had reached a street at right angles to ours, and had scattered among the ruins. The lieutenant was blowing his whistle again to regroup us, when two Mark III's suddenly came into sight. They rolled up to the lieutenant, who stood in the middle of the street waving them forward. After a brief consultation, they moved obliquely into the street we had just left, advancing toward the Bolsheviks. The lieutenant tried to reorganize us again, and we set off in the wake of the tanks, which made an infernal din in the rubble-filled streets. I jumped from the corners of buildings to piles of rubble, in a state of terror, unable to grasp why I was there, or to distinguish anything to fire at. Four seconds at a time, our tanks would disappear from view in the turmoil of dust and smoke and flames, but they always re-emerged, with their guns firing. Soon we had run past the point where our retreat had begun, and into an open space surrounded by wooden peasant houses grouped around a pond. The tanks were driving around the pond, crushing every obstacle. On the far side of the pond we could easily see men running in several directions. We stood on the bank and opened a concentrated fire. Another German company arrived on our right and threw grenades at a house in which some of the enemy had taken shelter. Our tanks were now on the other side of the pond and were flattening the position just taken from the enemy. At last I had the opportunity to fire at some Russians. They were no more than thirty yards away, running from the house our soldiers had attacked with grenades. At least ten Mausers fired, and not one of the Russians stood up again. The fact that we were advancing, and that we felt ourselves suddenly in control of the situation, stimulated us in spite of everything. We had just dislodged an enemy numerically stronger than we, as was always the case in Russia, and we felt as if we'd been given wings. The sound of firing and the groans of the wounded incited us to massacre the Russians who had inflicted us with so many horrifying wounds. An attacking army is always more enthusiastic than an army on the defensive, and more likely to accomplish prodigies. This was particularly true of the German army, which was organized to attack, and whose defense consisted of slowing the enemy by counterattack. A few of our men took over a Russian cannon and immediately put it into action. A rapid liaison was established between our two tanks and this newly improvised artillery, which poured all the shells just captured from the Russians onto precisely selected targets. Then the tanks turned back, leaving the defense of the area to us. Directed by the lieutenant, we placed ourselves as best we could, in readiness for any new surprises. We could hear the sound of continuous firing all around us. A fine rain began to fall. At dusk, we were still exchanging fire with the enemy, who had grown bolder, and were trying to come back. With darkness, our terror returned, and the firing almost stopped. The lieutenant sent someone to fetch some flares. To the southwest, the horizon lit up in time with sporadic heavy artillery fire. Without knowing it, we had become part of the Third Battle of Kharkov, whose front extended for some two hundred miles around the city. With darkness and rain, the fighting for our group was almost over. Behind us, we could still hear the sound of automatics, which penetrated the noise of engines. Our vehicles were using the darkness to try to get through the Russian barrage. We thought that at any moment we might see the Popovs running toward us through the night. A Volkswagen came up from behind with all its lights out. The driver spoke for a moment with the leader of our group and then handed some flat mines to four of our men. With white faces, they went off into the darkness to place the mines on either side of the pond. Five minutes later, we heard a rough cry from the left, and a short time after that, two of the four came back from the right. After another half hour, we concluded that the two who had gone to the left had run into a Russian knife. Much later that night, when we were all feeling overwhelmed by sleep, we witnessed a tragedy that froze my blood. We had just thrown about a dozen grenades at random to forestall some suspected danger, when a prolonged and penetrating cry rose from the hole on my left. It lasted for several minutes, as if it were coming from the throat of someone who was fighting desperately. Then there was a cry for help, which brought us all from our holes and shelters. About ten of us ran toward the sound, 
the darkness was torn by the white lights of several shots. Fortunately, no one was hit. We arrived at the edge of a foxhole, where a Russian, who had just thrown down his revolver, was holding his hands in the air. At the bottom of the hole, two men were fighting. One of them, a Russian, was waving a large cutlass, holding a man from our group pinned beneath him. Two of us covered the Russian who had raised his hands, while a young Obergefreiter jumped into the hole and struck the other Russian a blow on the back of his neck with a trenching tool. The Russian let go at once and the German who had been under him, who had just missed having his throat cut, ran up to ground level. He was covered with blood, brandishing the Russian knife with one hand, like a madman while with the other he tried to stop the flow of blood pouring from his wound. Where is he? He shouted in a fury. Where's the other one? In a few bounding steps he reached the two men and their prisoner. Before anyone could do anything, he had run his knife into the belly of the petrified Russian. Cutthroat, he yelled, looking with wild eyes for another belly to open. We had to hold him so he wouldn't run past our lines. Let me go, he shrieked. I want to show these savages how to use a knife. Shut up, shouted the lieutenant, exasperated by having to deal with such a motley crew. Get back into your foxholes before Ivan machine guns the lot of you. The lunatic, who was losing a lot of blood, was dragged to the rear by two men. I went back to the hole I was sharing with four others. I would gladly have fallen asleep, but nervous exhaustion kept me awake. I had not yet absorbed all the emotions of the day and was suffering a belated reaction. The intermittent rain began to soak into our clothes and weight them down. The pond gave off a faint smell. Two men began to snore. Throughout the night, which seemed interminable, I kept up a dull conversation with my companions to prevent a nervous collapse. In the distance we could hear the continuous rumble of our retreating trucks. Enemy action began again well before dawn. Flares above our position blinded us with their unexpected white lights. We looked at each other in wordless confusion. The intensity of this diabolic light threw a sinister, almost indecent glare on our ghostly faces. At daybreak, enemy artillery poured a hail of projectiles of every caliber onto the road about a quarter of a mile behind us. Beyond my hole, when I dared look outside, I could see other helmets poking up here and there from below the ground. Under their visors, eyes gleaming with fatigue were trying to discern our immediate future on the dim bank across the pond. I scraped up some crumbs of vitamin biscuit, which was the last food in my possession. Insomnia and exhaustion made us incapable of grasping the situation with any precision. We were simply there, shivering and wet, and if even a small group of Russians had appeared we wouldn't have been able to stop them. Fortunately, the Soviets didn't attack, and we were only subjected to one round of mortar fire, which nevertheless wounded nine of us. At last the sun rose, and we felt somewhat better. When it reached its zenith, we were still waiting in our holes which the spring warmth had not been able to dry out. We had not been given any more food, but then a soldier of the Reich was supposed to be able to withstand cold, heat, rain, suffering, hunger, and fear. Our stomachs growled, and the blood beat in our temples and at our smallest joints. But the air and the earth and the universe were growling too. From habit, we were almost able to persuade ourselves that this was a possible way to live. I know of many who actually managed it. Toward six o'clock that evening, we were ordered to abandon our positions. This step required many precautions. We had to cover a considerable distance with all our equipment, while two men stayed behind to lay mines for the enemy. When we reached the ruins of the first house, we were finally able to straighten up. We went into the battered buildings whenever we could to look for food. I can remember devouring three raw potatoes and finding them delicious. We arrived at the crossroads from which our group had set out 24 hours earlier. The two mutilated but recognizable roads we had taken the day before had been turned into a jumble of churned earth. As far as I could see, the disabled carcasses of Wehrmacht vehicles lay scattered in a haze of whirling smoke across the ruins of what must once have been houses. There were several muddy German bodies, too, lying in rigid attitudes beside wrecked machines, waiting for the burial squad. Some men from the engineers were setting fire to the vehicles that blocked the road. We walked through this chaos for a while, 
supporting our wounded. A hundred yards away, another group, larger than ours, was also withdrawing, with arms and equipment. We followed the lieutenant as far as the regroupment center, abandoned by the officers two hours before we received the order to withdraw. Not a soul was left in the battered building which had housed the officers responsible for the defense of the town. A sergeant on a motorcycle was waiting alone in front of the building to instruct stragglers. The lieutenant seemed disgusted by the available options and continued to lead us westward. We covered another 12 miles on foot, constantly threatened by Soviet patrols, who would open fire without hesitation on even a single famished Lancer. After diving down some 30 times or more to avoid Russian salvos, we arrived at a Luftwaffe airfield which had already been abandoned. We thought that the wooden buildings, which were like the ones we had occupied on the Don, might still contain some scraps of food. Carrying our four wounded men on improvised stretchers, we walked toward one of the huts, stumbling with exhaustion. But we never reached it. A scene of intense horror stopped six or seven of us. We had just passed a bunker in which we noticed a body lying at the bottom. Two emaciated cats were eating one of its hands. I felt sick. Get out, you damned cats, shouted my companion. Everyone came over to look. The lieutenant, as sickened as I had been, threw a grenade. The two ghostly cats ran off into the countryside, while the explosion sent a column of more or less human debris straight up into the air, like a chimney. If the cats are eating stiffs, somebody said, there couldn't be much left in the pantry. There were still two bimotors with Maltese crosses on their wings, standing on the empty field, probably inoperable in some way. From the sky, we heard a disquieting sound, which was growing louder. We all turned our white faces the same way, suddenly realizing that we were standing beside two planes in the center of a vast, flat space and could hardly fail to attract attention. We scattered without waiting for any orders, flinging ourselves onto the ground, trying to escape those six black dots which were already falling toward us like lightning. I thought immediately of the bunker where the cats had been feasting. Six others had the same idea, and although I ran as fast as I could, I arrived next to last beside the hole where four soldiers were already trampling on what was left of a human being. I looked desperately into that crowded space, hoping that some miracle would make it larger. Two others were doing the same thing. Maybe we'd made a mistake. Maybe the planes were really ours. But that was impossible. The sound was unmistakable. The noise grew louder and louder. We threw ourselves down, painfully aware of our absolute exposure. I held my head between my hands and closed my eyes, trying to obliterate the muffled explosions which reached my partially blocked ears. I felt the fury of hell pass over me like a hurricane. The blows striking the earth shook every organ in my body, and I knew that I was going to die. Then the storm passed as quickly as it had come. I lifted my head to see the enemy formation break apart as it climbed higher into the pale blue sky. Here and there across the field, men were getting up and running for better cover. The Russian planes had regrouped and were turning as tightly as they could. Then they swooped down at us again. I felt a bitter presentiment freeze my blood. I began to run like a madman, with my legs flying, trying to force myself to go faster. But I knew that exhaustion had the upper hand, that I would never reach the road with its ditch which might shelter me. I kept stumbling over my heavy boots. In desperation and despite myself I fell onto the wet grass, instinctively aware that the planes were on top of us again. The first explosions shook the ground, filling me with a frantic fear. I scratched at the ground like a rabbit whose last hope of escape is to bury itself. I could hear the earth being torn and horrifying human shrieks. White flashes burned into my eyes through my clenched fists and eyelids. I lay there for two or three minutes which seemed like an eternity. When I finally looked up the two bimotors were burning like torches. The Russian planes were far off turning back into formation for another attack. They had pulled up after this one in all directions. Once again I called on all my reserves of strength to get up and run, the other way this time, to the wooden buildings, which suddenly seemed to offer refuge. I had covered about a third of the distance when the Russian planes attacked shooting rockets into the buildings, which disintegrated like matchwood.
After a few moments of further terror, we could hear the engines of the planes fading into the distance. Everyone who was able stood up again. No one spoke. We stared at the flames, at the sky, at the reddening heaps of human remains. Our lieutenant, who seemed to have lost his sanity, although he was unhurt, was running from one wounded man to another. Shit! Someone shouted. Another attack like that, and there won't be anyone left. They've just left us here. We'll never get out. Shut up, shouted the lieutenant who was supporting a wounded man. War is never a picnic. Who did he think he was telling? We gathered around him. He lifted the shoulders of a poor fellow covered with mud and blood, who was laughing to split his sides. For a moment I thought he was crying with pain, but he was in fact howling with laughter. Das ist der Philosoph, someone said. I had never noticed the man before. His friend added that he had always believed he would return home unscathed. Three of us tried to lift him to his feet, but soon realized this was impossible. His bursts of laughter were interrupted by words which I understood perfectly and thought about for a long time afterward, and which still trouble me. As I remember his laugh, there was nothing mad about it. It was more like the laugh of someone who has been the victim of a practical joke, a farce in which he had believed, until suddenly he realized his folly. No one questioned the philosopher, but he himself, through his hilarity and his agony, tried to explain. Now I know why. I know why. It's too simple. It's idiotic. Perhaps we would have learned what he meant, but a sudden surge of blood poured from his mouth and ended his life. We dug graves for the new victims, and then stretched out, exhausted, on the bed of warm ashes that marked the site of the destroyed buildings. At nightfall we were wakened by the sound of guns, which seemed to be following us. By now we all felt desperately hungry and thirsty. Despite our rest we had not recovered our strength, and we looked appalling. We stared at each other suspiciously, wondering if the next fellow didn't have a couple of biscuits hidden somewhere, forgetting the lessons of comradeship we had been taught in Poland. But apparently, we were all cleaned out. If anyone had been hiding something, we could scarcely have reproached him, as we all might easily have done the same thing. In the darkness, as we fled the curtain of flares which had pursued us since our retreat from the dawn, we heard once again the sound of a moving column, and were once again filled with panic. The night was as black as pitch. A fine rain was falling. We followed the lieutenant. God knows where he was taking us. No one spoke. Our strength seemed barely adequate to move our legs, weighted by exhaustion and mud. Finally, the lieutenant spoke. Maybe they'll go by without seeing us. Are any of you anti-tank gunners? Quickly, our solitary Spandau was set up for a final effort of defense. Luckily, the exhaustion which made my temples throb under my leaden helmet prevented me from clearly grasping the seriousness of our situation. The simple fact that we had stopped walking presented my foundering body with a moment of relief, which had to be used to the utmost. I knew that my fear would return with my breath, and that I would again be aware of everything that was happening. The first black mass which came into view, with all its lights out, seemed to be some kind of light vehicle. We tried to see what it was, but the darkness was too thick. Then we heard tank treads, unmistakable and frightening as those who have heard the sound on the front at night will appreciate. As the noise grew louder, our panic increased. While some were trying to see where the tanks would come from, others, including myself, lay with their faces pressed into the ground. Two black shapes loomed against the sky some thirty meters away. Another, less than ten meters from us, made the earth shake and every hair stand on end. Someone called out, Die Malta Cruze, Mein Gott, Kameraden, Hilfe, Hilfe, for me, who spoke German so badly and understood it even worse, this was a signal for everyone to save his skin. I jumped up and started to run. This, evidently, is what one should not do. Through the noise of the tanks, I could hear shouts and curses. The group had taken my action as a signal for general flight. Everyone had jumped up and was running, shouting at the tanks with the exception of the lieutenant and one or two more reflective, prudent soldiers. Later it occurred to me that even German tanks might have machine-gunned us, taking us for Russians, 
Also, they might have been Russian tanks. However, we managed to make ourselves recognized and were taken in by a detachment of the 25th Panzer Division, commanded by General Guderian. These men were extremely well equipped and had not been involved in our retreat. They put us wherever there was room, on the backs of the tanks, where the heat of the engine burned our buttocks. No one asked if we'd eaten, and it wasn't until hours later, under the rolling fire of the Russian artillery which was raking Kharkov, that we were served a hot, greasy soup, which we received like a benediction. It was here that I first saw one of the enormous tiger tanks and two or three panthers. I also saw, a few hours later, the appalling avalanche of the famous Katushas, which poured hours of devastating fire on the German infantry, advancing with appalling losses through the outlying district of Slavyansk Kineskov. Guderian's tanks took us right into Kharkov, where the Donitz battles had already been in progress for more than a week. Once again, the Wehrmacht took the battered city before losing it finally in September, after the failure of the Belgorod counteroffensive. Don found us in the sand pits to the northwest of the city, where our group was gone over with a fine toothed comb by the commandos responsible for sending men back to their original units. As they didn't know where most of these units were, the best they could do was to form the strays into new groups, which everyone wished to avoid. These new units, with no official affiliation or assignments, simply sapped the actual strength of the army as recorded by military registration and on the maps at headquarters. The men assigned to these varied and unmeasurable groups could not be fitted into any logical organization. Already classified as missing or dead by their original units, they were officially considered dead and used as unexpected reinforcements whom there was no reason to spare. Long lines of soldiers, sitting, lying down, asleep and awake, were waiting for orders which would somehow fit them into the battle. I can still remember the look of the Donitz Valley and the river, with its wide sandbanks stretching some eight or ten miles back from the water. The thunder of guns reached us from the front, which was about twenty miles to the south. The German attack was moving from the north and west. With their left wing protected by the Donets, the panzer assault was driving into the Russian artillery, which had rapidly crossed the river, in an attempt to follow up their counter-offensive. Now these batteries had been driven back to the river and were unable to recross it, as all the bridges were out. In effect, the Russians had just made the same mistake as the Germans at Stalingrad, although not on the same scale. In their haste to drive us out, they had overextended their supply lines and underestimated the forces pitted against them. A hundred thousand Russians, of whom fifty thousand were killed, were caught for over a week in the Slavyansk Kineskov pocket. Of course, I didn't know what had happened around Kharkov until months later. For me, the Donitz battle, like the battles of the Don and of Auchenny, was a smoking chaos, a wellspring of continuous fear, alarm and rumor, and thousands of explosions. I had just been reassigned and was waiting for further instructions with a handful of other filthy, shaggy men when a policeman handed me a scrap of paper. The police, like the commandos, were authorized to organize strays, and the scrap of paper purported to give us the route we must take to return to our company. It seemed that the 19th Rollbahn was operating in the neighborhood, and the three other fellows also belonged to it. We cleared out as quickly as we could. The fear of being incorporated into an impromptu battalion lent wings to our feet. I have never had a very strong sense of direction, but here in this chaos of mud and ruin, even a migratory bird would have lost the north. Our scrawled note only gave us the principal points to look for, which might have been recognizable to regiments camped on the spot. To us, however, in an entirely new landscape, it was almost impossible to distinguish one point from another. The rare signposts that remained on the battered streets had been twisted in the fighting and had to be disregarded. After a thousand false leads and a thousand delays, we finally found our company two days later. In the meantime, we had been pressed into service unrolling telephone wire for an SS regiment which was mounting an attack. I still remember a railway embankment which some very young SS were charging under heavy machine gun fire. We huddled in a drainage pipe which had been uncovered in a bombardment, waiting for the SS to take the area, which they did, with heavy losses. Beyond the two cement walls, 
the flash of mortar fire and red-hot metal fragments streaked through the air. Then the same regiment used us to supply a hobbit's battery, which had been engaged for several days in an artillery duel with the Soviet guns on the east bank of the Donets. We were moving the heavy projectiles from their distant depot when we ran into some men from our company repairing a collapsed bunker. The first familiar face I saw belonged to Olensheim. Hey, I shouted, running to my friend, followed by the three others. It's us! Olensheim stared as if he'd been struck by lightning. Another four, he shouted. God must be with us. Laos scratched you off the list long ago. There are still thirty who haven't showed up. We thought you must have been put in one of the scrap units. Don't mention bad luck, I said. Where's Hals? Ed? That fellow has all the luck. Right now he's in Trevda being taken care of while we dig up this damn dirt. Was he wounded? A fragment in the neck. Absolutely nothing. But he was collected along with the seriously wounded. He said he was unconscious for two hours. But he always exaggerates. And Lenson. He's fine. He's changing a tread over there. Laos arrived, and we instinctively saluted. Glad to see you boys. Really glad. He shook each of us by the hand, his old soldier's face filled with emotion. Then he took a few steps backward. Announce yourselves clearly and intelligibly the way I taught you. We conformed to the prescribed pattern with a good will that came from a deep sense of comradeship. But, apart from this encounter, everything looked dark. The sky was filled with lowering clouds which threatened rain, and at the four cardinal points white flashes preceded geysers of damp earth and rubble by fractions of seconds. A short time later, Lenson, who was heavier and stronger than I, lifted me bodily from the ground in his delight at seeing me again. Despite the heavy labor we had to perform, the day was colored by the joy of this reunion. Two days later, I managed to get to Trevda, which was some twenty-five miles from the front. Another fellow gave me his place in the DKW he was supposed to drive, and I was able to visit Hals. I found him in a swarm of wounded men, singing at the top of his lungs. Spring had arrived at last, and the heavily wounded were cavorting between two avenues of wild pear trees. Hals was unable to curb his delight at seeing me. I was carried in triumph by men who had lost arms who were powdered with sulfonilamides and smeared with unguents. I was made to finish the remains of all the bottles they had opened, and accordingly was not able to keep the appointment I had made with the fellow who had brought me out. After waiting for a while, he grew bored and left without me. I was taken back much later by a driver attached to my camp. Hales made me promise to visit him again, but I never had the chance. A few days later, the doctor found him fit, and he rejoined us. Halls detested the squalid cellar where we were established, and following his lead, I volunteered for service in the motorized infantry. We were fed up with digging and acting as maidservants to the rest of the army. This decision almost cost us our lives many times, but even now, looking back on everything that happened, I cannot regret having belonged to a combat unit. We discovered a sense of comradeship which I have never found again, inexplicable and steady, through thick and thin.